In introducing our featured speaker, Mayor Wally Dean, he is indeed fortunate that I'm his good friend because I have in my hands his campaign brochure <laughs> from three and a half years ago. And so I promise not to go through the uh, promises he made <laughs> in order to remain his good friend. But it does offer a wealth of recommendation that I can use today. Wally Dean has done a lot for our community. He's been born, he, <laughs> been born, he has <laughs> been born and uh, raised on the peninsula. He knows this community well. His business experience in a previous life was president and CEO of VIP Inc. His background also includes a stint with uh, Crown Zellerbach in the marketing department. He has served in many volunteer organizations, San Mateo and Western States Sheriff's Aero Squadron past commander. He's been involved with the De Anza Cupertino Aquatics and has been a past president. He's been involved with AYSO and the Peninsula Swim League Board of Directors. And amongst the honors that he has received has been the 1990 De Anza College President's Award and both the City of Cupertino and San Mateo County Distinguished and Outstanding Service Award recipient. In addition, he has received the Western United States Aviation Law Enforcement Award. I know him best having worked with him on different community projects. More specifically, to Cupertino, he has served on the Parks and Rec Commission for over three years, 1988 to 91. And then in November of 91, he ran for the City Council, and he is now completing his fourth year on the City Council. He is the founder and father of CityNet, which has brought us much local, state, and national recognition as a community. We owe him much for that. And my own, my own Wally story that I have is about five years ago, I happened to run into Wally and Heather and their kids uh, in Hawaii on, on the island of Maui. And so I, I spent a few minutes talking to, to Wally. And as I was walking away, I heard his daughter say to a friend, geez, my daddy knows everybody. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce to you a man that is our mayor and somebody that does know everybody, Mayor Wally Dean. As you can see, we're going to do something a little different today. When I first decided to get involved in city government, there were certain philosophies that I had that I thought were extremely important. One being the Northern California lifestyles. My father was with Pan American flying all over the world and we got to travel a great deal. And every capital that I went to, every town, every foreign country, I always compared it back to the peninsula. And what was amazing is what we take as standard is now actually the exception. What we have here is so precious, that's so unique, we need to guard it, we need to protect it. And that's why I took the first step in. What we want to do is try to maintain what makes Northern California so special. As this is going on, I see a transition going on in the society. When we look back at early starts, we had when man was first starting out, he went into the agricultural age and where high technology was then was going from a hoe to a plow. Governments were based on soil content, climate, water. Those were important things. As that progressed, we went to the industrial age. And in the industrial age, all of a sudden, it was iron ore, supplies, labor, transportation. And what's happening now is we're going into something that's probably the strangest of all. We're going into an area that the earthbound product is sand for silicon. What's transpiring now is the information age. We're just going in it. We see trends all over. We had labor forces in middle management, gone, computers. Accounting teams, gone, computers. And what we have to do is get prepared for that. And that's what we're trying. Today, I will be introducing to you the key for the future. It's some elements that we took and we said, throw away the state of the city speech. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate. We need to change it. I wanted to bring in the future. I wanted to bring in knowledge, technology, and new ideas. So I called the superintendent of schools at Fremont Union. And I said, give me five kids, one from each school. Bring them to me. We got together. We picked five subjects that had to relate to city. Silly relevance. What I want you to do today is listen to what they're saying. See through their eyes hear through their ears, 
It's critical. Let them know by your response if they're on target. As we go through the subjects, I will be interspersing city information when appropriate. But what's key now is this is the future coming up. Please give them the latitude and understanding. I'd like to start out with our first speaker from Fremont High School, Rosina Lozano. Imagine, excuse me, imagine Santa Clara Valley 40 years ago. Imagine orchards all around. Now, focus on Fremont Avenue, a dirt road. You'd probably see the Paypack family on their way to an event at Fremont High School. There, they would find the entire community gathered to have fun, talk with friends, and support their local high school and its students. At that time in our history, high school and church events were probably the most well-attended community events in communal social events. If you, when you were imagining, perhaps you felt a sense of warmth and belonging, that sense of community spirit. Things have changed. Fremont Avenue is no longer a dirt road, and you have to look very hard to find any signs of an orchard. Santa Clara Valley is now more commonly called Silicon Valley. Our new suburban community seems to have brought less opportunities for neighbors to become good friends or for community members to get together in frequent, more personal celebrations. Many people find themselves coming home from work, going into their garage, entering their houses, and shutting out the rest of the world. Instead of high school or other community entertainments, we might look to cable TV, rented videos, or driving out of town as means of entertainment. In a way, that sense of warmth and connectedness our community spirit has dwindled. I see a future which can start to change this pattern. In fact, it's quite easy to start. We have briefly taken a glimpse at a positive aspect from our, future, from our community's past. I'd like you to consider bringing some of the past back to help improve our community's future. No matter how developed, no matter how prosperous or technologically advanced a community is, it can still lack in quality if its people don't feel a sense of warmth and belonging. In closing, I make this challenge to every adult here to attend one local high school activity, perhaps a play, sports activity, music concert, or speech competition. Your presence will give us, as students, a sense of joy, and pride, a real sense of appreciation. I challenge us teenagers to invite one adult, neighbor, or friend to one of our activities and to respect those who already do attend. By accepting this challenge, we will be taking a positive step toward creating a more stable and warm environment for our communities. A sense of the good community begins with one good act by an individual. Join me in these acts. See through their eyes, hear through their ears. What used to be, in the old days, a high school-centered environment has drifted away. They need the help. They need the community to get involved. They need the parents' interaction. Please support that. What we're going to do, instead of going into city matters right now, I'm going to skip over, go right into education. And with education from Monta Vista High School, Ms. Laura Shue. High upon a placard in bold letters in the Fremont Union High School District Office is its vision statement to make our youth lifelong learners, informed and active citizens of the world, knowledgeable and self-directed members of the workplace, and a discerning participants in the arts. Cupertino schools have come a long way in working towards this vision and are still currently striving towards it. From the national perspective, Education America is beset by lack of fundings, violence, high dropout rates, overpopulation, and illiteracy. California shares all these problems we hear about every day, and more, with high birth rates and a flood of immigrants. 
Three years ago, California spent less on education per student than any other industrial state in the nation. Despite these grim statistics we are flooded with, I believe that our schools are progressing forward. As Cupertino has grown from an orchard town into a bustling city, our outstanding schools have sprouted from the roots of Cupertino. Our learning institutions have developed into such complex systems that one could only truly comprehend them by being an active participant. Perhaps the most conspicuous feature of our schools would be the overwhelming diversity of students conglomerating and contributing to the overall school experience. The curriculum in our schools is constantly changing with the changes in society, making classrooms more interactive and stimulating. New classes such as power and energy and internet have students learning hands-on. The wisdom of this new interactive participation can best be described by the Chinese philosopher Confucius. I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. In addition, the housing system and tracking system are currently being, being experimented with, having both beneficial and negative results. It is not only within the schools that we observe a gradual metamorphosis. The vital relationship between school and community has been strengthened by exponential factors. In many schools, the Parent Teacher Association, or PTA, has been changed to the Parent Teacher Student Association. School site councils and principal coffee gatherings also play a crucial channel for communication. The state of minds of students also seem to greatly deviate from those of the past. Firstly, keen competition and pressure that hold strong presence in our schools sometimes have detrimental effects. They oftentimes obscure the essence of education, true learning, and assimilating of knowledge. We must maintain the ideals of education and encourage learning for the sake of learning at all grade levels. While we focus on the changes that are occurring today, we must also consider the various prospects of the future. With increasing population, it is essential that we recognize and address the individual students and their needs through programs such as the Extended Learning Program, English Language Development, and Arts and Music. While we must be willing to take risks to suit the changing needs of society, they must be taken with extreme caution and planning. Community participation is also key to making the wheels of education turn because schools cannot and do not exist in a vacuum. Despite the overwhelming possibilities that the future holds, we must always cherish the fundamental essence of education and start early to stimulate the natural desire to learn in each student. Winston Churchill once said, the empires of the mind are the empires of the future, and education is the tool to create these empires. <clears throat> if you talk to any realtor within a community, the key three points are always location, location, location. Cupertino makes an exception to that. It's education, education, education. The educational system in the city of Cupertino right now provides resale value for houses probably higher than any other one ingredient in the city. Education, that's critical. What the city has done to back up that commitment is commit $5 million to the Cupertino Unified School District to redo all their fields. Now, there's a good side to that and there's a bad side to that. Unfortunately, the work is so good, the fields look so pristine, all of a sudden you see these kids running around tearing it up and you're going, don't do that, don't do that. That's what they're there for though. The work that's gone into the school system hopefully will be completed by the end of this year, finishing I think with Kennedy. We will have the nicest set of schools, facilities, that could be matched with anybody. We're extremely proud of that. And that's $5 million plus the maintenance every year. It's picked up by the city. On another issue that's supporting education, that De Anza College, Martha Canner, Dr. Canner came over and she said, we need help. We need $125,000 for the De Anza entrance. And the city backed that up. We came up with cold, hard cash. The other issue that we've instituted this year is the Cupertino Mayor's Award. We're trying to generate a response between students, and we don't care if it's academic, athletic, art forms, whatever it is, if we think in a resume environment that they can put Mayor's Award. Great, let them do it. We want to put a dialogue between City Hall and the students of this city. Now, according to uh, education, one of the key areas is libraries. 
And we've been very fortunate to have two, two strong individuals on our council and in our staff to push the library issue. One is Barb Koppel, one is Don Brown. They committed many, many hours uh, to get the library issue closed. We've got it secured. It's going to come back online, full strength. But what we need to do is take a reality check. We need to take one step back and look at what's going on in California on libraries. California, right now, the California public library system ranks 50th nationally in hours open to the public. California schools, libraries rank 50th dollars spent per student in library materials. With a spin towards education, California ranks 50th in class size ratio, 50th in books per student, 50th in computers per student. California educational system is in the bottom 20% of spending per students. This used to be an institution that led the nation. States modeled their systems after us. What's happened? This isn't all bad news. There's one more glip, but it's been seen, and in a marketing environment, that's critical. You see the trend. What's happened right now is the product that's coming out of the K-12 environment has a flaw. When the students are graduating from those schools and going into a four-year California school, what they're finding is 40% of the kids have to take remedial classes. 40% of the kids take remedial classes. The highest at San Diego State, 80% are taking remedial classes, both in math and reading. Something's wrong. Fortunately, in Cupertino, our two school districts have seen the problem. Homestead High School has got the redesign program. Not sure that's the right answer, but they're taking a step. Cupertino Unified has got the portal system, the alternate education system. The problem's been seen. They're working on the answer. We need that support. Moving on to another subject, speaking of Homestead High School, I'd like to give you our next topic. It's government from Homestead High School, Mr. Brian Blanchard. In 1955, when the city of Cupertino was first incorporated, the situations and challenges that faced the government were quite different than those of today. Back then, the national government was in the middle of the Cold War. Nowadays, we are mainly concerned with finding out what to do with all the surplus equipment from the Cold War and how to pay the bill. At the same time, however, we have had an explosion in bureaucracy and red tape, combined with a sharp drop in voter turnout. All in all, the overall picture is one of an increasingly complex government and an increasingly uninformed electorate. But first, let's look at some of the changes that our government has undergone during these past 40 years. Government of 40 years ago was much smaller and much simpler than that of today. We've seen an explosion in the growth of the number of committees, subcommittees, staff, bureaucracy, which make our national government today one of the largest employers in the entire nation. Businesses have noticed a sharp increase in the number of regulations and rules that they have to follow in order to conduct their business. Also, right before the turn of the year, I picked up the Mercury News and looked in it and opened up to a special section entitled 462 New Laws for 1995. But this is not the most startling of all years, as earlier in the 1990s, we saw up to 1,162 new laws in a transition from one year to the next. So, the law books are getting heavier, regulations are increasing, as so is bureaucracy. But unfortunately, the information and the participation of the electorate is way down. Back in the 1950s, low voter turnout was considered to be around 60%, with the average being somewhere around 73%. Nowadays, in the 1994 election, here in the city of Cupertino, we had only a 37% voter turnout. In fact, the high for the entire Bay Area was Morgan Hill, with just over 56.1%, a bare majority of registered voters, not even necessarily including all the total people who were eligible to vote, simply the ones who registered. However, in the future, we can reverse these trends. Information is readily available to every person with such things as the internet, cable news networks, etc., putting us in touch in close touch with Washington and enabling us to see this information. 
We just need to realize that each one of us has a role to play in our government here locally, to participate in local government functions, as well as our responsibilities to vote in state and national elections. We must also see that the children of our society grow up in schools learning the importance of participation in a democratic society and learning the importance of participating at all levels of government. Democracy is not a spectator sport, but if we act now and if we work hard, we can ensure that America will forever remain the great democracy it has always been. I think he likes government. <laughs> what we're going to go into now is, as you probably noticed, the screen. This is the first multimedia presentation done at a State of the City speech. Uh, what we're going to try to do is graphically show you what's going on in the city. We think it's extremely important. This was brought about by Mike Bruner, and I talked to him before the meeting. I was watching the Planning Commission. He was making a presentation, and he made some statements with regard to financial comments within the city and how we were spending money. And at the time, if you can come up with a graph, Pete, um, at the time, we, I was eating a pizza and it levitated. And that's why I think we have, this is the first levitation of the pizza. What I found is the burden is on us. We need to get the information to you. We need to get it in a format where it's easy to understand because I think what you'll see is a different trend than you may have assumed. What I'm showing you right now is the general fund revenue. There's two areas I want to bring up, taxes and franchise licenses. Totals two-thirds of our entire income source. Now, why franchise? Two weeks ago, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal ruled in favor of the phone company to come in and get in the cable television business. We derive 6% franchise freeze from TCI. With the advent of Pac Bell coming in without a franchise fee, TCI is not going to pay. What we've done right now is we think it's a pretty serious problem. We, I, have sent a, I have sent a letter to the Cable Advisory Committee. I expect to have back in six months legislation, a legislative proposal, where no matter what the ruling is of the federal courts, when Pac Bell comes in to sell cable television in this city, they're going to pay a franchise fee. We're also working on the satellite, Hughes Satellite System. We want the franchise fee. And TCI, we want you to keep utilizing your franchise fee. That's imperative. When you go to the next graph, you'll see general fund taxes. This is a breakout. Now there's two, there's two areas I want you to look at here. One is sales tax, which is predominant, 58%. But the other is property tax. Now on property tax, I ask you a favor, hold that thought, we're gonna come back to property tax. But see that it's, it's reflective at 18%. Going to the next graph, major sales category, this is more of an information hit. It shows that general retailer is the main derivative of our income in the sales tax area. Moving to the next graph. Now this is where, if you're going to take notes, this is where to start sharpening the pencil. This, this graph that you've just seen shows Cupertino's share of property taxes. Everyone considers property taxes as enormous. Maybe they are. Cupertino's share is 2% of the 1% tax. You can see that we get nothing, virtually nothing. Now ask how do I show you that in a better vein Let's go to the next graph. Our average per household from property tax, all property tax, is $139 a year per house. What does our service cost to provide the average citizen? It comes out to $1,252. We're running a deficit, a deficit from property tax and services of $1,113. In other words, what you have in your mind on property tax pulling the entire burden, it's not even coming close. Remember that, $139. Let me transcend into the next, the general trends. You've all heard governments are running out of money, it's getting tight. This is important. Um, you need to understand what the city of Cupertino has done. What you have on the top line, the green line, is our projection of operations if nothing had changed. The other two lines show expenses and revenue. And what we've happened is we had to, when we were starting to see the blips on the screen, the revenue wasn't coming in. We were getting cut back on federal and state funding. We had to cut. We cut 11% of our staff across the board. 
We also eliminated all travel for the city. Basically, you get one trip to the League of Cities. That was it. I mean, really, we truly tightened screws. While this was going on, we were being hit by the county, SPCA, no more, we have to pick it up. Same thing, we've already gone through the library situation. We had to fund that. Well, it's got to come from somewhere, and we've adjusted. And the trend here is you need to understand it's not a smooth sailing ship in the way of free money just flowing in. It doesn't happen that way. We're counting every penny. Let's go to the next one. This is a brief description of what the state is taking away. This is what they've taken away so far. Cigarette tax, parking violations, property tax, cost of book prisoners, and charge of tax collection. What is really scary is the bottom. What will they take next? John Vasconcellos the other day made a statement. It scared me. You hear this glowing report on the budget picture in the state. Vasconcellos' claim is by July of this year, the state will run out of money. At that time, we'll have to borrow $7 billion for the state. That's what's going on. Now, what happens is when they come looking for money, guess where they come? Down to the lowest form of level of government, local government. Let me go to the next graph. One more graph to emphasize what's transpired. In our daily operation, when we're cutting back everything, capital projects, you'll see that in 1989, 1990, that was the last big year. The crunch came after that. What we've done is in the graph, you'll see the actual capital spending on capital improvement projects, and then everything below that line lists every project we've just put on hold. It's just stopped. Those were programmed to go on an average budget, and we're trying to keep the budget in line. That's why government, that's why government is running on a shoestring. Those projects, $3.4 million, and it's actually more than that, have stopped. Next graph, general fund reserve. Now, cities would kill for this. This is the money that we have in the bank. This is our piggy bank. And what we're doing here is showing that the interest that we earn on this source of income is critical because it's going right back in to pay the bills that the property tax isn't. One of the issues that just surfaced the other day is a litigation we're putting up against Dean Witter. I'd like to explain. In the course of investments for any city, we have a very basic rule. Usually it's five years, nothing fancy, no leverage uh, investments like Orange County, nothing, very quick and clean. Any change of that has to be voted on by council. When you see assets like this sitting around, we draw salespeople from all over, trying to sell us merchandise. But they have to meet the criteria, and that's what happened. Someone sold us something that they said met the criteria, and it did not. Carol Atwood was the one that picked it up. She presented it to council. Council shook their head. We decided to seek legal counsel. We gave the information to legal counsel. Council came back and said, yeah, they're, they're not right. We took a 5-0 vote, council, all council members. We go for it. We want our money back, and that's when the suit was generated. We think it's uh, nothing shameful. We want our money back. They try to. Uh, Fast talk us and we caught them, pure and simple. Moving from financial reserves, let me bring up what's gone on in the city. For the first time, City Hall is computerized. You could walk in in the past and look around and yes, there were computers on desks hooked up to printers and they were acting as basically typewriters. Right now, the entire City Hall is network. So much network that you can come in from the outside now and put a request right to the desk of a department head one of the first cities to do it. The other thing that's coming up that you hear press on is the downtown plan, and from the Chamber of Commerce, especially the advent of the trees. The funding, because of this issue, is very important. We have an assessment district funding of $900,000 that's dedicated to this project. Other than that, there's nothing. So keep those numbers. The cost of the project is more than obviously 900,000. We have an entry fee to start out with. That's where it is. The other issue that we're going to be tackling in June of this year is wipe the slate clean. We want to reevaluate the traffic patterns in the city of Cupertino. If we have block roads, do we still want to have block roads? If we have no left turns, do we still want to have no left turns? We took a hit from the fabulous Highway 85. What? <laughs> Highway 85. Um, and we're trying to come in with, we, we've seen what's happened to our business community, we need to come in with an effective solution to move traffic around the city. And that's, that happens in June. Our parks and recreation program have switched to a new style, it's called pay for yourself. 
Uh, the programs will not be subsidized. They're run on a basis that the amount of people coming in, the cost generated, have to cover each other. Our compost program has moved to a year-round cycle. It was nine months, and now we upped it because we had so many wonderful complaints. <laughs> they missed the service, and we corrected that. Our housing element plan. When we get numbers from the state, and it's been extremely difficult working with the state, case in point, our job housing imbalance. They came in and told us we had 42,000 jobs in the city of Cupertino. You look at that number and you go, geez, great number. The problem is, if you look at Apple, Tandem, Hewlett Packard, and Measure X, combine all their employee base, it comes to 10,000. 10,000 employees. Where's the rest of the people? Let's say Valco has 1,000. Where are the rest of the people? Now, what happens to us in the government is, the state issues us a law, it's a mandate. We have to respond to that. Now, they've modified their position from 42,000 to 36,000. Where are the people? We're working with it. Even with all that, the general plan that was passed two years ago met the standard for the state, and they passed us. That's significant. We've also incorporated a new program where the city manager meets with each superintendent and the chancellor of the college every month. We're starting a dialogue to try to move information around effectively. If uh, Pat Lampson needs some equipment or needs a bulldozer somewhere, and we have it, we'll provide it. Same thing with Fremont Union, same thing with the Anza College, sharing things. We need to get efficient. Our permit streamlining project from our planning department, we've tried to get it much faster than it is. I think the prime example, the latest prime example is Microsoft. They came in, they budgeted six, six months to get it through City Hall, their project. It took six weeks. We've implemented three new types. We've had an over-the-counter permit program, we have a temporary permit program, and a one-hour turnaround on a re-roof program. There will be more announcements made second quarter of this year on a whole new permitting program. Now, since I'm talking about business and Microsoft, what I'd like to transition is to our business category from Cupertino High, Stu High School, Mr. Eric Shea. When the city of Cupertino was first founded, few people could have imagined, much less predicted, the vigorous suburbia that it would eventually grow to become. Let me take you on a trip back in time when Cupertino was but a small pit stop in the state of California with a few local stores. The economic roots of the city was in great vineyards as it was with the rest of the Santa Clara Valley. Clipper ship captains traveling between New Jersey and San Francisco, the primary seaport of California, set up these vineyards and employed citizens in the valley. Where De Anza College is now, for instance, there used to be a major vineyard. The grapes were succeeded by the fruits and orchards that earned Santa Clara the valley, the land of my heart's delight. Cupertino's sunsweet prunes and apricots also earned their fame from this time period. One problem that faced the orchards was what to do when cold weather threatened to kill the fruit. To alleviate this problem, orchard management burned buckets of tar to produce a black cloud of smog which rose and hung above the orchards, keeping the temperatures warm. Fortunately for us, today's businesses are much more environmentally responsible and have taken steps to cut back pollution instead of add to it. Beginning in the 1930s, the landmark in Cupertino was a seed and grain store operated by the Cali Brothers. It supplied livestock feed for the greater San Jose area until the 1970s, when the agrarian nature of the economy entirely disappeared, along with the store. Overnight, it seemed entire bedroom communities changed Cupertino from a rural setting to suburbia. This would only be the start of a brand new city. The temperate climate of Cupertino bred and attracted would-be businesses, and out of our school came the people the likes of Stephen Jobs and Stephen Wozniak. Today, Cupertino, as the heart of the technological revolution, is home to Tandem Computers, Hewlett Packard, and of course, Apple Computers. There's an interesting, somewhat unknown story about Jobs and Wozniak in their endeavors at Apple. One man had lent the two aspiring entrepreneurs a few thousand dollars in exchange for lowly shares of stock. Today, these stocks are worth tens of millions of dollars. There's a lesson to be learned here. If the city of Cupertino is to continue to march forward in progress as a capital of Silicon Valley, we must be willing to take a little risk with innovations and invest in our future. How, you might ask? The future lies in investing locally. Profits from small businesses provide most of the funding for the city of Cupertino. 
Simply by shopping Cupertino, we will be investing in the welfare of our own community. The future lies in innovations locally. The future lies with the people you see in our schools. Businesses of tomorrow can blame no one for poorly educated, ill-suited managers and workers if they do not invest in the young minds of today. To Cupertino businesses, I encourage you to provide volunteer speakers at schools, to act as role models in job shadowing programs, to serve as tutors, to teach how to apply resource and personnel management, management theories. Our future is depending upon all of us to take an active part. The city cannot exist independently of local businesses, and neither can businesses prosper without the support of the community. I hope we can learn from history's lessons and invest in today's local entrepreneurs. I hope businesses, in return, will invest in tomorrow's citizens that we see in today's schools. To borrow some words from John F. Kennedy, I ask all of you to, do, to ask not what the future can do for you, but ask what you can do for the future. When we look at the graph on Cupertino business, it's very simple. We've, we've had a stagflation in sales. The market that is in, uh, before us is somewhat predictable. It's going in one way, and it's a price-sensitive way. What happened is in 1980, from 1980 to 1990, the number of shopping centers in the United States almost doubled. For every man, woman, and child in the United States, there's 18 square feet of retail space out there. Kind of an oversupply. When we look at the trends in marketing, what were shopping centers, now went to strip centers, now went to specialty stores, now went to big box. Your big box retailers are doing a heck of a lot of business, and it again comes back to price sensitivity. What we tried to do at City Hall was infomercials. We started with an infomercial. What we wanted to do is take the assets, assets of the city, and share them with the business community. We felt it was critically important. We were using Sony three-chip cameras. We had a, a television crew of three people available to you. We had editing supplies available to you. The goal was to take your product, your store, your retail outlet, put it on cable television, and let the people know where to shop. We want the information out. We felt it was a very effective tool. It was almost crossing the line, and I had to twist a few arms from my fellow councilmen that were a little squirmish about it, that infomercials weren't a commercial invest investment. What we wanted is your success. We got frustrated. We could not break the barrier of the business community to get the interest involved from the business side, just cross the line and say, hey, free advertising. We'll play it for you 10 times a day. I don't care, as long as the people go into your stores and buy. We couldn't get the business community. The next thing that we tried to do, we, we noticed the five centers of shopping in Cupertino all have frontages except for the crossroads, have frontages and then stores in back. We tried to come up with a way, an electric signage, that could get all the retailers the exposure from the street, one sign. You could have font styles, you could have colors, you could have anything you want, but someone traveling down that street and they saw the eye works and it's in the back, would know where to go. They had an opportunity to at least see the sign. Fell on deaf ears. We generated some interest, no action. That was a concern. Then we tried to get into electronic marketing, the CityNet project. We have 60% of the people that work in Cupertino commute. Our goal was sell them something when they're here. We want the retail tax dollars. If we could get a version that was so easy to use, point and click, picture, buy, I want, that's what we were looking for. Again, we ran into a barrier with the business community. We will keep trying. You need to know of our frustration. Um, if you have any ideas, we're always available to it. But it's a definite trend. The city is going out of its way to try to generate retail sex tax dollars for you, the merchants. The other issue that scares us is traffic off Highway 85. Our numbers right now are down 20 to 26 percent. The other thing that annoys me is the neighboring cities along 85 are advertising, hey, come on down, we're only five minutes away on Highway 85. That's money out of our pockets, and I don't like it. What scares me even more is what's coming next. We've proved that price-sensitive shopping is the future. 
What scares me is the electronic method of price sensitive shopping. If I don't own a warehouse, if I don't employ people, but I can get you a visual message and a real cheap price, let's say 20% off Costco, 20% off Costco, would you buy it? You're damn right you'd buy it. The problem is that electronic merchant could be in Indiana. And all of a sudden, what's coming into the state of California is not being sold in the state of California, it's not being sold in the state of Cupertino or the city of Cupertino. And that scares me. And unfortunately, that's what's coming. Broadband, high-speed data transmission, and they're going to sell you something. And the merchants have to understand that. It scares me. The business summit. Three years ago, we introduced a concept as a management tool for the city. We brought in distinguished business people from the community of Cupertino. We brought in every department head within City Hall and we had a joint meeting. What we needed to hear is what the city doing to you in the retail environment correct. Is it working? Do we have a problem? And we came out of that meeting with some very positive feedback. We changed something at the marketplace. We had to rezone some space, not a problem. All of a sudden there was an interaction between business and government and it was working. Coming this year, second quarter of this year, we're introducing the Business Summit again with hopefully the same positive results. We need it. The other issue that's come up this year, and I think it's an excellent idea, and it's generated from the Chamber of Commerce, I call it up close and personal with the business community, is going out with the merchants and manufacturers that inhibit, inhabit Cupertino, inhibit, inhabit Cupertino, and meet them. Listen to what they're saying. Listen to their ideas. It's important. That's worked very well. Don Allen's got a computerized list. It's great. We analyze the feedback. That's important. To the business community, I challenge you, get involved. We need a unified group, please. Moving on to technology, I give you a, a student from Lindbrook High School, Mao Mei Lu. Fifty years ago, a fabulous invention entered the world of high technology. It was called the Automated Sequence Controlled Calculator. We now consider it to be one of the first computers. Although it weighed many tons and occupied several rooms, the ASCC was considered to be the most amazing technological advance of the year. How times have changed. Now the ASCC is a mere computer dinosaur in the age of personal computers and laptops. As a quarter of Americans have bought computers, our society has entered the computer age. At Limburg High School, we are experiencing a technology craze. Utilizing grants from Pacific Bell, we have hooked up onto the information superhighway. Every student and teacher has the opportunity to get online. Trips to the computer lab have become a daily ritual for many. Delighted teachers bring their classes into the computer lab to discover the real world applications of their sometimes disconnected subject material. Although new technology will open doors to more efficient research and communication, it possesses the potential to cause harm in our society. As students of all ages grow accustomed to the convenience of calculators and computers, there is the possibility that they will grow lacking the knowledge and know-how to figure out problems without electronic aid. We may be cultivating a generation which is helpless without computers. Electronic communication also lacks the personal qualities of a face-to-face -face conversation. Eye contact and handshakes are sacrificed for convenience sake. The society grows more and more impersonal. As time passes, we may witness the emergence of technological gaps in society. As students grasp the opportunities of the internet through schools, many older men and women may miss out. Even within the student population, there is a strong possibility of a gap between the technologically elite and the technologically poor. At Limbrook, we are challenged to include all students. On the other hand, new technology possesses the potential to open our minds to new worlds and people. I see teachers who are bored the same daily and sometimes yearly routine. The new technology transforms them. Acting like teenagers again, at, acting like teenagers again, teachers excitedly pursue the possibilities of the internet and what it may contribute to their classes. Students are captivated in and enthralled by the seamless, endless possibilities of the internet. As we enthusiastically send electronic mail to our friends in college and elsewhere, we see that for those too lazy to write a letter and lick a stamp, electronic mail is an easy alternative. Nintendo sets and telephones are left behind as students opt to spend several hours a week chatting through their computers. The internet has the potential to crush student apathy. 
Through the internet, students can make personal contacts throughout the world. As we realize the effects that current events have on real people, we tend to be more sympathetic and concerned about what happens outside of our neighborhood limits. But as we forge a new path into a future where technology will drastically change our lives, those of us who have had the great opportunity to join the information superhighway now have an obligation to see that others do not fall through the cracks. If we are to promote a global community, every one of us must be participants. Only with the spirit of unity can we successfully create a better world for all. In my opening remarks, as I traveled around the world, I said what we accept as standard is the exception in other places. When it comes to technology, it's the same thing. What we accept as standard operating procedures is the exception everywhere other than Silicon Valley. First time I got a call from the White House, from the Vice President's office, the um, Secret Service detail. I pick up the phone, they said, this is the Secret Service. I'm going, right, <laughs> what are you calling us for? What they've done is they've heard about what we're doing. They heard about how we're taking a community and attaching it electronically. How you can go into City Hall, how you can go into the schools, how you can go into a business, how you can pull images down from a satellite. Blew them away. They're not used to seeing that. We've got it. Standard. What we're doing now that's exciting, Bert Viscovich is heading the project up, is we're networking City Hall to the point where you can go in and retrieve maps, demographics, permits. That's 30 days away. What we're trying to do is completely make this the envy of any other city in the United States. If you don't think the city of Sunnyvale, the well-managed city, uh, cringes every time they see a city net story in the paper, you're crazy. If you don't think Palo Alto, the city with the attitude, goes nuts when they see the vice presidents coming to Cupertino, and not Palo Alto, drives them nuts. What we've done is we've garnered a lot of attention for the first time. Instead of being the city next door, we're the city that's leading it, and it's in technology. We're the first city in the United States to go completely wireless. The majority of you probably don't even know what wireless is. What we've done is got 84 transmitting poles around the city. You take a computer, you can broadcast, instead of going through a phone line, from one point to another on a network. The sophistication of the project is, from a city side, if I'm in public works and I have an inspector out there and he's had a problem and he's got his power book, he can take a picture of the problem, plug it into the power book and send it back to Bert at City Hall online. If Bert gets the information, he can chat online. No wires. This is truly Flash Gordon and it's here in Cupertino and we're the first city in the United States to do it. We're also the first city in the United States to introduce interactive postal service. Never been done before. They've flown groups out from Washington. They heard about it on the, the news. They read about it in the papers and it ran on a national news show. They couldn't believe it. They sent film crews out to see Cupertino Post Office in action electronically. And the next exciting challenge, and we're pushing the edge of the envelope, next month, February, we're going to try interactive government. And this was a hard sell. It's something new. Uh, we. We depend on two things. On the city side, we think we can do it. But all of a sudden, there's a responsibility on the user side outside. What we're trying to do is get the most communication from the populace to government, direct. If in the course of the meeting, if you have an idea or you see something that says, wait a minute, that's not right. I need to get that information in. Cupertino will be the first city in the United States to do it. We're leading the way. This is critical. What we're about to do, is create standards in our planning department to have computerized simulations of building projects. Now our staff is writing the standards for those. That's pretty darn important. And so instead of taking a chance on a design and how it fits into a hill, something like that, through a computer you'll be able to see it. Three dimensional, spin around, complete architectural analysis. That's important. We want to get efficient. We want to do it right. As you can see, Cupertino is obviously leading the way into tomorrow. At a time, I think it's important to stand back, look what's gone on in Cupertino, and reflect with music and pictures. I give you Cupertino.
the future. Thank you very much.